Hi there, I'm Matt. I've been writing Pop Motion for four years. It's an animation library. And today I'm going to talk to you about animations in React and specifically making them simple. Hopefully so simple that they're actually simpler than, I'm going to stop saying simple soon, and they're simpler than CSS transitions. To do that, we're going to use a new animation library called Pose. Um, when you hear a uh, new animation library, you might be thinking, of course, why? It's, it's kind of, um, we're still in the midst of JavaScript fatigue, I know. And recently, there's been a lot of um, new animation libraries for React specifically. Uh, there's so many animation libraries for JavaScript that I myself have too. Um, there's, uh, <laughs> there's three reasons that I'm going to go through in turn. And then I'm going to get on to the uh, specifics of um, how it works and why it makes things so much simpler. First one is, I don't know if you've ever tried to animate React um, with a traditional animation library, but it can get messy, imperative, and the code that you write when it's imperative is quite brittle. The more you write, the more prone it is to breakage. This is how I'd make a React component hoverable using a spring. At the top, you've got a set ref comp uh, function, and then you've got your, um, you'd, you'd update the transform style. Uh, you've got a spring function. And down here, you've got the on mouse enter and on mouse leave. You're manually binding all of these things. And at any point in here, you could break something. By comparison, CSS looks a lot more like that. There'd probably be a transition thing if it could do uh, spring animations. But this is pretty much what it looks like. So it would be great if we could get something that simple, but in uh, JavaScript. I don't, this is an inside joke between the three of us. I'm definitely in on what these two are laughing about. Um, the second thing is um, assumed, assumed knowledge. Um, the idea that, that you know some things and you assume everyone else knows them. So my background is actually uh, design. I used to do design and flash animations as well. And Adobe use a lot of essentially skeuomorphic terms, like uh, in Photoshop, every tool is used and named after like a physical implement that somebody would have used once to physically adjust a photo. Um, flash is no different. Like the uh, timeline editor has the terms keyframes. It's got tween. Um, and tween is actually the bedrock of pop motion and green sock um, and anime, actually. These are all fairly like well-worn JavaScript animation libraries. And somebody turned around after looking at my messy imperative code one day, and she said, what is a tween? And that sort of blew my mind, because I thought when she was looking through my messy imperative code that it was because it was messy imperative. And she just couldn't look, uh, she couldn't figure out all of this code that I'd like fairly lazily strewn across the component. And she didn't know if she was going to break something. Um, and I thought, hey, oh, this is a fair question. But then when I heard what is a tween, I realized I don't know what people don't know. My knowledge is embedded in this history of um, animation. Like tween as a term goes all the way, all the way back to um, early animation techniques where, two pe where the, the key animators would draw the keyframes. Um, and they'd be the well-paid guys in America. And then they'd ship those off to a factory on the other side of the world. And some, some people, like a team of animators, um, would fill in the gaps, basically. It's short for in between. So in modern context, like, does tween really have any, any meaning anymore? And if you don't know what a tween is, are you going to bother to look? Is it just a scary term? If you're not that interested in animations, are you going to go any further, or does your journey stop there? And so I felt like, even as a term, including spring physics decay and all the other um, animation terms that we use in pop motion, they were all kind of prohibitive. And the last is um, what I call the emerging reality, which is the thought that um, we look at our devices like, OK, I'm going to develop for a mobile with a retina display, or I'm going to develop for, uh, back in the day, it would have been some Windows application, or I'm going to develop for virtual reality. Um, when you look at it as a continuum, these devices, both their input and the output, are becoming increasingly higher fidelity. And I love the web, and I don't want to see it get like, lost behind or left behind in this sort of uh, gradual improvement of quality as, they, as these devices consume more of our senses 
as they do with great fidelity, the web sort of looks a bit shonky. You can already see it when you use a mobile website and put that next to the equivalent app. The app is almost certainly better animated. It responds quicker. And the problem is people aren't going to put that much effort into the animations on their website if they don't have the time. We iterate so quickly and we're deleting components as quickly as we're making them. So to spend all this time messing around with imperative animations that we're only going to delete, it seems like a waste of time pretty quickly, especially if you're in a really high velocity startup. So I wanted to make something that was in a way making code disposable like as well as making the nice animations, we could delete the thing or change the thing quickly and iterate fast. So this is what React Pose looks like. I used to talk about Pose, but really um, I, I found out the other day that 98% of people consume Pose via React Pose. Um, it was a surprise to me, but I, I prefer it myself. It plays well with um, React's declarative approach and it sorts out some of the plumbing just by being a component, which is nice. Um, you've got a pose div here, it's making a ball. That's essentially equivalent to a div, but as we'll see in a second, it just takes one property to make that animate. So the first feature, I'm just gonna go through a bunch of features now that sort of, with that background, um, these are the features that I've come up with that should hopefully address some of the common pain points with React animations. So the first one's called Magic Animations. Um, it's the idea that you don't need to know what animation you should be using to animate something. So here in our pose div, all we've done is define two states. We want one to be visible and one to be hidden. And we've defined opacity one and opacity zero. By using React Pose, you've already opted in to the idea that you want to use an animation. So we shouldn't have to ask you to define one. Down here, we're passing in is visible as a prop in our React component, and we're setting a pose. Now, a pose maps to the poses or the states um, sort of uh, defined in the pose component. So we're either passing in visible or hidden. Now, this is the animation that gets played. We've got a set interval, and it's just um, flicking between the two poses. The animation that it's chosen is a tween with a linear, velocity, uh, linear easing because that's just how opacity is best animated. If this was an X or Y position, it would be using a spring with quite a lot of give. So when it moves and then stops abruptly, there'll be a bit of overshoot. Or if it changes direction, some of that momentum and velocity is conserved in the subsequent animation. And if it was scale or, or rotate, we'd choose a slightly different animation based on what's best for that animation at any given time. And I want to get to a point where we can tell the thing, OK, I want a playful animation. Or I want a stern animation because it's an error message. And I want this and that. And you should be able to define these animations in personalities. And what's spat out is something that gives the user that kind of, that kind of feeling. The second thing is animate anything. So in CSS, you can't actually animate anything, which is um, surprising to me. But uh, you can actually animate box shadows. So this is a particularly bad example. But um, we can do box shadow in JavaScript quite easily, so that's nice. Um, one of the things that I think you can't do so easily is radial gradients, linear gradients, um, SVG paths, but you can animate all of those uh, quite simply with this. Um, and again, we've got this on a set timeout. There was no uh, transitions defined here. It just decided that uh, because it's a box shadow, we're going to use a tween again, but this time with ease out. And so obviously, there's going to be lots of times when uh, you want to define your own custom transition because you're an animator or you've been given a spec. You can do that here too. Um, everything, every pop motion animation is serialized. So it's an abstraction. You don't have to give the, you used to have to give the um, animation function itself back from a transition function. But now I've gotten to a point where everything's serialized. Uh, we can say we want type, sp type spring, we could say keyframes, we could say anything that we want. Um, all of the velocity and the from uh, and the to is all provided behind the scenes, so we don't have to bother with manually piping any of that through like we might have had to with a more imperative JavaScript library. And this is what that looks like with those settings. Again, this is just a set interval flicking between the uh, closed and there's an open state as well that's essentially the same as this. 
So Pose isn't just here to make animation simpler, it's also meant to make interaction simpler. From before, that hover example could quite easily have been a drag example, and you'd have even more plumbing. And especially if you wanted to do dragging and hovering, there's actually a lot of weird uh, logic that you have to consider. For instance, what happens if someone hovers on, starts dragging, and then they drag so fast that the uh, inherent lag in the input and the div causes a hover out? Do we animate to the hover out, but we're still dragging? And there's a few things in there that this actually just uh, solves. So we have a hoverable true and draggable true. This is uh, necessary, annoyingly, and I'll show you why in a second. Uh, but it just means that we attach the hover and drag event listeners to this element. Here we've got our initial state, and it's a special pose. If you set um, the init pose, then by default, uh, this will be used to style the component or the element. And then we've got two more. We've got a hover on our drag, um, which are set to 1.4 and 1.2 scale, respectively. So we can see a hover's working. It's used to spring again, because we're using scale. It's a, it's a positional slash transformational um, style. So we tend to use springs for those, because it feels a bit more uh, energetic and a bit more interactive. And then when you um, press down and start dragging and then let go, the hover state is the one that's reapplied, even though we haven't re-hovered. It knows not to go back to the init until we hover off. And there's all sorts of um, callbacks as well for the drag start and drag end. And just to get back to why we had hoverable true and draggable true, every pose, the, every pose component can have children and the children can have children. And when you set the pose at the top, that pose flows all the way through the, the pose DOM, I guess, or the, the pose tree. So at the top here, we've got parent, which is a posed uh, UL. It's, again, it's got visible and hidden. X, 0%, uh, minus 100%. But then it's got a child component, which has its own visible and hidden. Now at the top, we're only setting pose once. We don't have to set it all the way through. And it's worth pointing out that even though child here is a direct child of parent, the child could be anywhere in the DOM. And it, the poses are piped through using the uh, con context API, using the context API. And uh, so, yeah. so. So this is what that would look like. So when this opens and closes, all of the items are animating at the same time. This is kind of cool because like, we're only having to set one bit of logic or business logic in the actual component. And all of the animation logic is kept somewhere else in its own little place. I like to keep it in style.js because these style components, but people could put that pretty much anywhere they like. But what would be cooler is if those items didn't animate in until the, um, until the sidebar or whatever dialogue mechanism we're using, until that's animated in fully as well. And it'd be even cooler if they were staggered. So that's what we can do. Every parent can control the animations of its children. This one on the, on the visible has a before children true. So that just says, um, animate me before animating any of my children. And then this second one, stagger children says, when you do animate my children, go across, um, stagger them by 100 milliseconds. And likewise, there's a converse after children true. So before we hide me, the sidebar, the parent, animate away all of my children. And from that, we get an animation that's a bit more se sequenced. And that's still by using that just one binary is visible piece of logic. So all the other logic is a completely it's not our problem anymore, which is nice. Um, and this is like my final uh, demonstration. In React Pose, there's a, for the DOM at least, because Pose is also for React Native, uh, but it's a little behind through certain limitations of uh, React Animated. I want to port it to Reanimated. Um, and because of the platform itself, uh, it, it, it's a bit harder to, it was harder than I thought, but it, it, it's going to get there. Pose group isn't there yet, but it is on React DOM. And what this does is track the entrance and exiting of the children, of its direct children this time. It only applies to direct pose components. In this example, we're going to show reordering. I'm doing this because you've probably all seen, if you do React or if you do React animations, you've probably seen React transition group, CSS transition group. And that handles things moving in and out of the component tree, which is pretty cool. Um, but this one also handles reordering 
and it also animates any elements if one was to be removed at the top of a list for instance all of the other animate all of the other components within the pose group would animate to their new positions so this following demonstration this is literally all the code that I, I haven't like left anything out there's no there's not even any um, any animations uh, defined or poses sorry defined in this it's just a posed li that's all we're saying and then we're giving them as direct children to the pose group items is the the caveat here it's on a set interval and it's been shuffled every like you know two seconds or something um, and then from that they're animated into place and they're animated using because it's x and y or it's actually just y uh, it's animated automatically with a spring and you can customize this uh, this one I, I, the, the API is a little uh, not as nice for this because it uses what's called flip transitions which are a more performant way of moving things around the page uh, what's really happening is that we're reordering everything and then with the flip technique you invert the transform so all of the um, elements and components look like they were where they were when they started, but they're not really, they're in the new position. And then you uninvert the transform animatedly, and then you get this. So that's actually the end of my uh, presentation. Um, you two are telling me what was so funny after this. Uh, the, you can see pop motion pose at uh, popmotion.o forward slash pose, and my Twitter is popmotion.js. And I, I've, I've actually just uh, quit work, so I'm a week into working on this full time. Uh, it'll be a few more months of this before I have to go and find some money, so that's nice. So there should be lots of updates there anyway. There is a feature called dynamic pro poses. So in this example, every single value that you guys saw was predefined. So we had, uh, we had you know, x is five or whatever, but actually all of those can be a function. So you can pass your target through as props or whatever, and all of the props to a pose component will go through to the functions that are defining the poses, basically. So you can, um, you can do literally anything. You can do custom stagger techniques. So uh, instead of just using stagger children, you can use delay. And based on the I, the index of the component, you could do something really funky like you know, using math.sign to make it make it the staggering by a wave or some crazy shit. Um, yeah, you can you can do that basically. The question was, can you apply uh, posed to custom components? Um, and yeah, you can. Um, I it wasn't my PR, but it, people wanted it, so um, it's in there. But I t I tend to like brush it under the carpet a little bit. It's a great feature if you need it but it adds a little bit of complexity that you need to pass through this property called hostref and uh, you need to pass that to your, the actual DOM element that's gonna be animated. And the problem is as well, it doesn't work with posed group or post group, the posed group component. So you can do this, but um, using the primitives is a little cleaner, I guess. But the capability is there if you are in a pinch, yeah. I personally use it with style components because all you have to do is make your pose component and then wrap that in styled I wouldn't do it the other way around for the reasons I mentioned earlier, but um, I would, yeah, you can do styled and then posed. So reuse the, the ref problem? Yeah, so there, there's no ref problem if you do style posed, yeah. Thank you, Matt, for coming back.